I do actually work as an economist in my field um, and uh, do a lot of financial work uh, in systems. And I have kind of a hobby of just helping people with financial acumen and doing spreadsheets and some consulting. So uh, we had a talk uh, a few months ago, I think it was late January, where I came in and one of the concerns was to have a talk about uh, teaching the community uh, financial literacy. So financial literacy is not taught in schools. There's only 17 states in the United States that have some form of financial literacy taught in schools. And so um, it's really something that's a gap. Either people know it on their own or they don't learn it. So there's a talk that was done before, and it was done in January. It was about family and budget. And so after that, the next step is to talk about investing once you've got a savings plan. So that talk is available online. It's actually in the evite uh, for um, on Facebook. If you look on the invite to this talk to this event, you'll see there's a link for the original talk that's on MCC East Bay's YouTube page. So I recommend going there. Uh, one of the things I didn't do is start with a dua. So I wanted to start with a dua and. Uh, May Allah grant us enough provision to care for our families, to keep us free from being in the need of provision from others. Uh, may Allah allow us always to have enough provision to have time to work towards the pressure of Allah, to read his book and to remember his messenger, and to have enough time to help those in need who come to us for help. Amin. Uh, the other thing I wanted to share was a uh, beautiful du'a of risk that I had learned. Uh, I also learned another du'a of risk. So the most beautiful form of risk is not money. Rather, it is tranquility of the soul, healthiness of a body, purity, purity of a heart, soundness of a thought, du'a from a mother, kindness from a father, presence of a brother, laughter of a son, caring of a friend, du'a from someone who loves you for the sake of Allah. May Allah grant us all these forms of risk, inshallah. So let's get started. I know there's a, a, a folks who are, are watching online, and inshallah, we'll, we'll keep going. Uh, I'd like the session to be a little bit interactive, but I do want to get through the hour. One of the goals is to try to get done before Isha, and then we can have a Q&A after Isha. Let me jump to the agenda. So we'll talk a little bit about Islamic guidance. Uh, we'll talk about budget prerequisites and review, a little bit of a review for um, why uh, things need to be done in a certain way and to kind of know how to plan and budget. Uh, a couple of baby steps that were left, uh, referred to in the original talk. Um, then the most important part of the graph, actually, the, the class today, is to talk about compounded growth. How growth, how you invest, if you invest in, in, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in, in a fund or in a savings account, that it continuously grows, and uh, how, how it can build its, on its own momentum. So we want to make sure that that example is completely clear to folks today. Uh, it's the power of growth and the power of mathematics behind the growth. Um, then we'll talk about saving, investing, and risk. Those are kind of prerequisites for knowing. Um, investment sectors and measuring uh, performance. So everybody's probably heard of the Dow and the S&P 500, the Standard and Poor's 500. So one of the goals tonight is to try to demystify jargon. I don't want to use acronyms that people don't know. I want to explain acronyms so that you know what you're doing. Um, and then uh, a couple of sample stocks, a couple of sample utility investing sectors, and mainly staying away from interest staying away from riba, and how to invest in a halal way, and how to do your research. Um, so the prerequisite of this is if you, if you had a friend who told you that he had $10,000, and he was at a car lot, and he didn't know, he didn't have a, he didn't pass a driver's license test, didn't have a permit, didn't know what kind of car they wanted, didn't really know what horsepower or torque was, didn't know what miles per gallon was, and they said they wanted to buy a car, what would you tell them? get off the lot, get off the lot. So one of the things we want to do today is to actually teach you guys all those basics so that you're ready to buy a car, i.e. you're ready to buy a stock. So that's, that's the goal of tonight. It's pretty basic. This is stock and investing one, econ one, stock investing one. So if you have some, there might be some financial planners out here, or people who have their own firms, I don't know, but I'm trying to keep it very basic. Um, and I'd like the questions at that appropriate level. So let me know if I'm too complicated or too, too easy. And, and I'll feel you guys as, a, as an audience as well. So that's, that's the goal of tonight. Um, and when people ask me about investing, um, you know, I want to make sure that they understand some of the things that they need to know before they invest. So there's a lot that goes on to it. So, so let's go move on to the first slide. Okay, so the Quranic injunction, we have 
that Allah tells us that those who engage in riba are actually making war with him. And he talks about four, four involvements with riba. Earning riba and collecting riba from people. Okay, Paying riba. Uh, witnessing, co uh, writing contracts for riba. And witnessing contracts for riba. So these are four things that you can do with riba that Allah says that you, if you do that, you're making war with him. And this uh, involvement in riba is considered a kaba'ir sin. And the category of kaba'ir sins are lying, cheating, stealing, killing. So it's very serious. So we want to talk about folks. We want to talk to you today about, about how to do this in, in, a, in a way that we can avoid, avoid displeasure with Allah. Okay? And I want everybody tonight, so actually jumping to the, my last point, is to sit together, and if you're online, make niya to, to do tawbah. Make niya to do tawbah and stay away from riba. I know a family who was looking for a house. They were starting a family. And the husband and the wife made intention of riba, of, of staying away from riba. They actually looked online for uh, riba-free investments and riba-free banks. They only found one at the time. I'm talking about 20 years ago. Uh, they decided they had a limited budget, and they went to a real estate agent, a bunch of real estate agents, and they wanted to live in a pretty expensive city. They went to the real estate agents in the city, and they said, this is our budget. We want to find a house. We're willing to find a fixer-upper. Every real estate agent laughed at them said, no, we can't help you. One real estate agent said, okay, we'll see what we can do. This person, this, this couple had made toba for riba. They, they didn't want to be involved in it at all. They found a house in their budget that was a fixer-upper. Then they had to fix the house, and they had $200,000 to fix the house. They found a construction company that wanted to be in the Bay Area that was out of state, that was willing to build their house for a low price and their $200,000 budget. And they built their house and bought their house without riba. Out of nowhere, this miracle happened. So what, the reason why I'm telling you the story is that make the intention. Make the intention to stay away from it. And Allah will provide. Kun fayakun. Allah can do anything. So um, uh, there's a couple of other things you can uh, talk about. Uh, saving and investing is actually a plan. It's a strategy. And we have the beautiful example of strategy of saving in order to uh, protect yourself from harm with the, in Surah Yusuf. In Surah Yusuf and Ayahs uh, uh, 46 through 49, you know, there's the dream. The, the Pharaoh has a dream. He says there's seven years of provision, then there's seven years of drought, and then if you do things properly, you can squeeze and you can, have, you can eat and you can press, press oil after seven more years. So Hazrat Yusuf is called from the, from the prison that he's in, and he actually says to the Pharaoh, it means that you, you, eat from what you need to, and then you save everything else in the first seven years. Then you store it for the next seven years and you use it in rations. And then after that, he says you can, uh, if you do that correctly, you can find a strategy and a plan out. So in Surah Yusuf, we have this example. And that's what we want to do investing. You know, we have ups and downs, we have times where we have our jobs and we don't have our jobs. So we want to make sure that we're using the example of the Quran. And then in that, there's also, um, Ayahs 54 to 56, where Hazrat Yusuf says to, uh, to the Pharaoh, uh, appoint me as a trusted, uh, a trusted guardian over this task. He takes the responsibility and says, I, I know what this means. I will take the responsibility to store. And he builds the storehouses and he preserves, he preserves the, the food and the rations for 14 years and they come out of it. And then he meets with his family. So, this, so Surah Yusuf goes on. So that's about, you know, saving for a rainy day and, and, and being able to, to make it from times of provision through times of tribulation. Um, the other thing I wanted to, to point out was another uh, uh, ayah that I saw in Surah Taqweer, the overthrowing. It's uh, Surah 81, ayah 4. Uh, the Quran says, it talks about the last day. And it says on the last day, um, full-term she-camels will be abandoned by their owners. So when I heard this ayah in high school, I was studying business I knew that the full-term she-camel is wealth that's about to double. You have a camel that's wealth, and it's about to give you another camel. And so we, when, when we talk about investing, that is an investment that provides a dividend. It provides an income. It actually grows for you. And on that day, it's such a serious day that people fear Allah, that they fear what's happening on that day. They abandon their wealth that is about to double. So it's something that's interesting to me uh, in talking about this ayah is that Allah knows that how much we love wealth and how wealth increases 
and, and that's, that's dear to us. So I wanted to talk about investing and show you the ayahs in the Quran that I had heard about or, or thought about investments. So, so I wanted to go on and do that. Um, so let's see. I wanted to also review the basics of uh, a, a very important uh, budgetary uh, graph. And this is called Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. It's a triangle. It's a pyramid. And it shows you the priorities of how you need to think about providing and building the wealth in your life. Okay, so the bottom is, is critical, it's red. And it's the physiological needs. We need air, food, water, shelter, sleep, clothing, and reproduction. So this is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It's from 1941, it's actually covered in my original talk. And it talks about building the pyramid from the foundation up. The second need is safety. Making sure you have personal security, making sure you have employment, resources, health, and property. So what happens is that you know you, once you've secured your basic needs, you want to secure safety and security. So we have to buy a house, we have to rent a house, we have to have insurance, we have to have a car. Those are the basic needs. Uh, after that, we have love and belonging. So friendship, intimacy, family, and a sense of connection. And then after that, once you've got those basic green, red, orange, and yellow covered, you have the uh, ability to look for esteem and then self-actualization. So until those basic needs are met, you shouldn't be looking for the other things. You've got to acquire the basic needs. And that's the way we need to, we need to think about it. So uh, when, you look at, uh, when you look at folks who don't plan properly, they'll go out and lease an expensive car, and they won't have enough money for their emergencies. They won't have enough money for medical emergencies. They won't have medical insurance. So the idea here is to make sure that you have the red and the orange and the yellow covered before you go out and try to buy a car that makes you look good. So those are the things that are that are, that are important, all right? And and I've and I've seen stories where people will come in, um, and they'll have a, they'll they'll lease a new Audi, they'll have at least a new a new uh, luxury car, but when you look at their finances, it's credit cards, their and their income isn't sufficient for their basic needs. And if something happens and the credit cards get cut off, then they won't they won't be able to pay their rent. So that's a situation a trap where people are using, looking at um, not acquiring the pyramid the right way. This, this actually picture of this uh, pyramid is on my phone. So whenever I make a, a long-term purchase, I, I think about this. Where is it? What am I doing? Right? So you got to own your car before and, and have your rent secured. Um, and then uh, a financial guru who's pretty famous, his name is Dave Ramsey. He's a Christian financial teacher. He's online. He has a, a syndicated radio show every week. Um, you can find him on YouTube. He's actually... Uh, a teacher who teaches all these basic things. It's, he's very good to listen to. And um, he has a financial base of steps that I covered in the next slide. And this is the seven step, seven step plan that we covered in the first talk about family and budgeting. The reason why I'm covering this again is so that we make sure that these basics are done before we get into sa uh, saving and investing. So you'll see the baby steps are, number one, get $1,000 saved up in an emergency fund. You have to have an oil change in your car. If you don't have cash to take care of those kinds of extra expenses, change the tires, maybe some medical expenses, you need that first $1,000. Once you have that $1,000, you start cutting up your credit cards, paying off all your debt, but cutting them up, because that's what people use. They're using credit cards and paying interest to pay for incidentals. So if you have the $1,000, then you can actually start cutting up those credit cards. It's no point to do step two before you do step one. It's not going to work. So this is a plan for success. Step three is trying to uh, save up three to six months of expenses and savings. People lose their jobs. They need to pay rent for several months. So three to six months is, is absolutely necessary. That's baby step three. So that's, the, that's the, uh, really the um, coverage of the first talk we had, which is budgeting and getting your house in order. So today we're going to talk about step four. And you'll notice that in uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, it completely matches this pyramid. The pyramid is matched by Dave, step, Dave Ramsey's steps. Secure the first thousand, which is the red, you know, and then uh, cut off the debt so that you're not bleeding money. And inshallah for us, we're trying to avoid riba at all costs. And number three, get the orange, get the orange secure, which is your safety, your safety net. Okay. And today we're going to be talking about how to do step four. So step four, he says, invest in tax-favored accounts, 
Step five, fund for college. So when you've taken care of your own investments and they're going, then you start thinking about your children and keep getting your children out of debt, paying off baby step, paying off your house. And then step seven is all the above. It's the blue and the green for Dave Ramsey. You gotta take care of step four, five, and six continuously for years and build wealth, inshallah. Okay, so this is a very important graph which kind of indicates what's going on in society today. I look at these graphs and try to understand, you know, what, what, what's really going on. So if you look at the black graph on the left side, you'll see that the, the, the black graph, as time goes on from 1975 to 2015, the black graph is dropping down lower and lower and lower. And that black graph shows that the average household savings rate. So in 2000, and, uh, in, in 1975, people were earning $100 and keeping $14 out of $100. Their savings rate was 14%. In 1975, people were doing pretty well. In 2017, that, that, that black point is at, is at two. So I'm referring to, I'm referring to the left axis here. So the black graph, this point. So the average family, the average family is saving $3 out of 100 if you're on the black graph. So um, if the average is $3, there's many, many people who are negative. Many, many people who are actually living month to month. They need to spend $105, they're bringing in 100, and they're going into debt for five bucks every month. So that's a bad cycle. So the black graph is the have-nots. And then the blue graph is the haves. So in society, we have the haves and the have-nots. The blue graph shows that as time goes on, people, are built, people who are investing are building more and more wealth. So if you look at the end of, uh, in 1975, people had $450,000 of wealth, the average household income. The average household had $450,000 of net wealth. If you look on the other side, where it's at the very bottom, that blue line is almost hitting 700,000. So people who are investing are building wealth. So if you're not on the blue, if you're not on the blue line, you're on the black line. And if you're not on the blue line, your money is not working for you. So I wanted to stress that the folks who are on the blue line are investing, and they're investing in compound growth. And that's how this wealth is being built. And that's what we're going to try to teach you tonight. Um, so the black line is also referred to as hand-to-mouth. A lot of people will say this is the hand-to-mouth family. So they they go, they earn, it comes in their hand, put it in their mouth, it's gone. There's nothing left over. Okay? So um, the next, the next uh, graph is, 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 uh, is something about strategy. This is what most people do. They get their paycheck, and if you look at the top, they get their paycheck, it goes into the checking account, then whatever's left over goes into the savings account, then whatever's left over they don't know because they don't budget, they don't have a plan. So that's, I don't know, question mark. And then whatever's left after that is, oh no, we don't have enough. So that's, that's the typical behavior of many, many people. And I think I shared the statistic last time that 40% of Americans, and we're a very literate society, don't actually have a budget. And 63% of Americans uh, answered the question that they, don't, they have some anxiety month to month over their monthly budget. They have some anxiety of, of over, over budgeting. They're worried. 63% of Americans. Okay? So uh, your, your actions are your strategy. So today, inshallah, we're going to get to a point where you guys have a plan and we teach you how to get to a plan, have a strategy. So a proper strategy is that you get a paycheck and tax deferred before your taxes are taken out. It goes into your investment account. Okay? Whatever's left over that goes into your savings account, and you use that savings to buy vacations, big ticket items, couch, furniture, things like that. And then after that, your income goes into your checking account, you pay your expenses, and you know exactly what those expenses are. Right? So this is the plan that we want to have. We want to move from the typical behavior to the strategic behavior. Right? Okay, so that's, that's the goal of tonight. Um, so... Um, Again, we want to, in order to do this, we want to repent from riba. And um, I actually have a, a quick story about a family 
um, they lived in Houston and they had a house that was you know, under $200,000. The wife was um, getting her education, her husband was working, had a couple of kids. And so they decided to, uh, um, when she was starting to work, they had a plan. She was gonna go to work and every, every part of her paycheck was going to be planned to pay off the house. Okay, so they had a plan to pay off the house. So every time she brought money in, they wrote a full 100% check of her income to pay off that house, right? And then on top of that, they had another strategy. They called their relatives and said, would you each give me $10,000? Because they wanted to get out of Riba quicker. They said, would you each give me $10,000? And some of the family members said, yes. And they asked, when do you need your $10,000? So one relative said in a year, and one relative said in three months. And they took the extra 10 or 50 or $40,000 that they got from five relatives, put it in the bank, paid that part off. So they even got to a quicker point where they paid off their house, and then she wrote checks to the relatives based on their calendar and their schedule. Each of their relatives that gave them $10,000 got their $10,000 back. Whatever was left over, they paid it off. That was the plan for the check, the check of the wife. And then after that, you know, she could quit work if she wanted to. She ended up staying at work, but it was completely luxury. Their house was paid off. So I wanted to tell you this is, this is, this is a strategic plan. It was somebody that you know, I hold as an example that I wanted to share with you guys. Okay, so now I have a little bit of a pop quiz. Okay, so um, Susan and Bill get married. They're both 25 years old. Bill wants to go to med school. So he enrolls in med school, and he goes to med school for 10 years. So he's 35 when he gets out of med school. While, they're t while, while he's going to med school, Susan is working and investing, right? She works and invests. So she puts $5,000 a month into investment account for 10 years. And then when Bill starts working, she stays home and has kids. And then Bill starts investing $5,000 a month. So that's the scenario, okay? So who thinks that after, when they both reach 60, who thinks that Susan has more money in her investment account than Bill? So Bill invests from 35 to 65, and Susan invests from 25 to 35, just 10 years. She doesn't touch it. And then Bill invests first. So who thinks that Susan has more money than Bill? Same amount, exactly the same amount, $5,000 a year. Okay, so both are investing $5,000 a year. Susan does it for, for her first 10 years, and then Bill does it from 35 to 65. Who thinks Susan has more money? Who thinks Bill has more money? Okay, and who thinks their money is fairly equal? Okay, so let me show the graphic. Compounded, compounded. So the, the investment is staying in, they're continuously investing it, and the income of it is staying in. So the idea here is the example is to give you guys the power of growth, okay? So Susan is the uh, gray line. So let me, let me demonstrate, I'll take this uh, mic here. So Susan, is Susan is investing from this point to this point, and then she's this gray line. She ends up at $602,000. She doesn't invest any more at the age of 35. Bill starts at 35, and he invests all the way to the age of 65. He ends up with $540,000. So the idea here, it seems counterintuitive, but even though she didn't invest after the age of 35, she got started early. So early is better than late and continuous, and that's the power of this example. Now, uh, Chris, who's the blue line, he starts at 25 and he continuously goes all the way to 65. He ends up with $1.142 million in that account. That's $5,000 a year, that's not much. That's $416,000 That's four hundred sixteen dollars per month. It's not a lot to be a millionaire for, the, for that investment time. And the idea here is that the the, the growth rate is 7%, and the uh, investment is $5,000 a year, and it's constantly reinvested. So the power of compound, compound growth is very, very powerful. It's very, very powerful. Okay, and so we want people to get started and get started early. This is just the graphic about the two are doing exactly the same thing. One just gets started 10 years earlier. We'll talk about that later. So we're gonna talk about it. It's just a, it's just a mathematical example. So both of them start, they, they both start at this, 
uh, the, they both start the company at the same time. One person starts investing in their 401k. You know, we all have 401ks, a lot of us do. They invest in their 401k. One person waits till they're 35 and they get to uh, 200,000. The other person, just by, standing, by starting 10 years earlier, they get to double the amount. So 10 years early gets you to double the amount. Question? Yeah. Yes, yes. So we're going to talk about that. The question was that if this is an example for 401k, there is a possibility that this value will drop. So this is average growth over the whole, the whole life, right? Um, but we'll, we'll show you the market and some of the risks. We're going to get into some of those things. I just wanted to. This is all sort of prerequisite to get you guys to understand some of the power of investing. Go ahead. With uh, the yeah, we'll do Q and after the, in the mortgage. It's it's kind of different because you're paying you're paying the interest. It's working against you. But the bank is benefiting from you like this. The bank is making the money like this off of you. So it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a double edged sword. If you invest, you make the money. If you don't invest and you pay interest, you're losing the money at this rate, at a faster and faster rate. Okay, so we're going to get into um, next, we're going to get into just a simple graph that shows the earlier you invest, this is, this is how much you need to invest to get to a million dollars at the age of 65. So if you start earlier, um, you only need to do $361 a month with the steady growth, the steady growth model, just mathematics. If you start later, you have to start investing. At the age of 40, you have to start investing $1,400 a month to get there. So the later you start, the target of a million dollars is, is harder to get to, right? Okay, so savings, savings, just a quick note on savings. Savings is very liquid. You have access to your money. It doesn't go down, and you pay very few fees on it. So most checking accounts and savings accounts are savings. Okay? I'm just stating that as a definition before we get into investing. Um, investing, uh, when you invest, you have a greater chance of losing your money than when you save. The money you invest in securities, mutual funds, and other similar investments typically is not federally insured. So savings is insured. So FDIC, everybody's heard most banks have FDIC, Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, backs it. So savings are insured and investments are not insured. Okay, so that's, that's the number one thing you need to know about investment. And then the other thing is investment allows you to grow your money, but it also allows you to lose your money. So you have risk and you have reward. So those are the, that's the second most important thing, right? Um, the last thing I wanted to tell you about investment, so that's the left box. Um, the right box tells you there's so many complicated products. People get burnt, you know, bogged down in the jargon when you're listening to the financial news on the radio, whatever. There's only very few types of investments. There's stocks, bonds, mutual funds, real estate, or commodities. Gold, silver, things like that. There's sophisticated commodities like you know, banks will buy barrels of oil, they'll speculate on a lot of things, but those are pretty much the categories of investments. And when we say staying away from interest, we're gonna stay away from bonds. Bonds guarantee you a rate of interest. You don't do any work for your money, you don't put any thought into your money, and interest is haram because of that. There's no effort, and it's, it's hoarding money and building money, and we want to completely stay away from bonds. So for us, today, we're talking about stocks, we're talking about the value of a stock. What is a stock? How does it grow? How do you evaluate it? And how do you choose what you want to do? Okay, and then again, there's real estate, so it's tangible. Um, and there's commodities and gold. Okay, and then uh, going back to Dave Ramsey's uh, baby steps, most of us, you know, when we get paid, we get paid in cash. Uh, if we have a house, we have home, home equity, so you want to pay that off as fast as possible. That's a way you build wealth, building cash and building home equity. 
The next thing you want to do is you want to make take advantage of your 401k stock options. And the next one you want to do is, if, you know, if you have some money on the side and you're doing a good job savings, you want to do some investments. So most people want to try to do at least one, two, and three, and possibly four and five, right? The rich, rich people, the, the, the number four, some companies, number five, some companies offer a pension. So if you have a company that, that offers a pension and you're thinking of leaving it, make sure you really know what you're giving up. A lot of people will go and leave, leave one job for another job, and they'll think the income is higher. If they're giving up a pension, they're giving up hundreds of thousands of dollars. Hundreds of thousands of dollars. Okay, a pension is very, very valuable, right? And then um, real estate holdings, if you, have, if you have the ability to buy more real estate, that's another way. And then commodities, gold and silver, and then you have the Rothschilds and the king of Saudi Arabia who buy art and yachts. Those are the things they invest in. So these are the kinds of things that, that you, can, you can do as an investment. All right, how are we doing on time? Well, 25 minutes, okay. But I need to get to the, to the investment part, okay? So uh, this is the difference between stocks and bonds. Uh, how do you evaluate what you're going to buy? When you, we're gonna stay away from bonds, and when we buy into a company, we're buying a stock. You should act and think like you're a partner in the company. What is the company doing? And you wanna make sure that you look at a couple things. The most important thing is SWOT. Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Okay, Uber has a threat, it's called Lyft, right? You wanna know if you're investing in Uber, what is Lyft going to do? If you're investing in Apple, what is Samsung going to do? What are the strengths of the Apple and are they gonna come out with a watch and do you think people are gonna buy that watch or are they just gonna buy the next iPhone? That's their strength, that's where they go to. Okay, so you got strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. You should definitely look at those things as you, as you think about a stock. Okay? Uh, the next thing you're going to look at is management. Okay, Steve Jobs passed away. Who is Tim Cook? Does he know what he's doing? Okay, that's the Apple CEO, right? So you need to look at the management. Quickly going down the list, uh, you want to look at their competition. You want to look at their profit loss. If you can, you want to look at the value of the company versus the stock you're buying. So is Apple worth $212 a share right now? I do not know. But you should know. Don't just buy it because someone else will come later and you're hoping that you buy it at 212 and someone will buy it at 230. Don't, that's what most people do. Oh, I'll just buy it. I think it's, I think someone else is gonna buy it at 230, so I'll buy it at 212. Is it worth 212? Because if the market corrects itself, it will be worth 185 and you will lose 30% of your, in, of your investment. So these are very, very important things. You get caught up in the stock market, sort of like a casino, just Keep playing and somebody else will come along and you'll take their money. That's, that's, not, that's, not, that's not how you should invest. And then the last thing is you should look at tax laws and regul regulation and acts of law. That's very, very boring stuff, but um, a lot of companies will have disclosures and they'll have things called matters of risk and matters of concern, meaning this law is going to change. So in the airline industry, laws and regulations are very, very crucial to their profits. Their profit margins are thin. So if you're going to buy an airline stock, you need to know. If you're going to buy a, 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 a communi telecommunication stock, you need to know. Uh, Uber and Lyft have a lot of regulation going on right now. I don't know what's going to happen, but a lot of, a lot of countries and cities are getting a little bit tired of this. Uber and just, just you know, uh, Lyft going all over the place, causing congestion and all the stuff they're doing, right? So that's very important when you look at stock. Risk. Okay, all investments inv involve taking on risk. It's important that you go into the investment in stocks, bonds, and mutual funds with the full understanding that you could lose all of your money in one investment. Okay, so that's my disclaimer for tonight. I'm not giving stock advice. I'm not giving investment advice. But this is very, very important. Uh, do you have a quick question? You have to read their financial statements. So every company is audited. There's an annual shareholder report, and it requires research. You can go on Wikipedia. You can look up the company. They, each company on Wikipedia and Google has a page. Click on it, and then it should take you to their financial disclosures. So this is sophisticated stuff. It's, it, but, but what I'm trying to stress here is that you need to do the research. Your money is on the line. 
and your wealth is on the line, right? Um, real quick, let me let me jump back. Okay, one of the things I wanted to show you also is it says notes on risk. See the, the notation at the top, sec.gov? So Securities Exchange Commission is the regulatory body for all investments in America. And sec.gov has a PDF that all of this comes from. I didn't write all this stuff. I just made copies of it. I'm trying to notate where you can go and do your research. A lot of my next few slides are actually pictures of websites so that you can know that the website's there and just click on it and start looking around doing your research. So we're going we're gonna to get there. Real quick question. The 10Q, the 10K, uh, matters of risk, matters of concern. That's a very important one. Yeah, yeah. They're, they have they have to disclose it. If they don't disclose it, there'll be fines levied against the, the, um, the company. And okay. I actually write those for my company. It's very, very sophisticated. So even when they're written, they're very sort of cloaked. They're not, they're not just going to say, hey, we're scared of this going on. They're going to say it in a very financially cloaked way. Brothers, sisters, let's hold our questions until after Isha, because there's a lot of people on live stream will go around the mic after yeah. Isha. And I will and everybody can hear you. Yeah. Thank you for the reminder. OK, so we're jumping into investment now. Okay. So this is a very, very important graph. This is not the pickup line that your stockbroker is going to tell you. They're not going to call you and say, what's your appetite for risk? Because they're trying to sell you stock. They are making money on you investing. So every time you invest, they make a percentage of the stocks, a percentage on the stocks that you buy. So this is the stock risk reward matrix. Sometimes it's a nine box matrix. In this case, it's a 12 box matrix. And it shows you that the more, the farther you go out on this axis, the more reward you want, the more risk you're taking, right? And these are the high risk sectors, right? And so when you look at something like utilities or real estate, they tend to be stable. They tend to be down here in these quadrants. You don't make a lot of money, right? It's not quick money, but it's also not a lot of risk. And then when you get into the, uh, into the NASDAQ funds, the funds that are technology companies that can either make millions of dollars or run out of funding and shut down. That's the dot coms that come up, come and go, come and go. Um, there were 3,000, I think I've mentioned this before, there were three, in a couple year span between 2011 and 2014, there were 3,000 uh, venture capital investments in companies. 39 of them made it. So. If you're, if you're going to play ball in that red box, you know, you have to put a lot of money out there to make a little bit of money, right? And venture capitalists want 100 times their return. So when they invest in a company, they want 10 times their return quickly, then they want 100 times because they're trying to hit it big. So this is a very important graph. So you want to think about what you want, how you want to play before you start to play. So remember my example. You're on a car lot. You have to know what kind of car you want to buy. It's very different. The, the stocks are just like cars. There's so many different products out there. Okay, so we talked about savings, investment. Um, now we're going to jump to investment sectors. So you have to know your risk, and you have to know what kind of investment sector you want to play in. Look at that graph on the, on the left, or on the far left. That is a spaghetti graph, okay? It shows the volatility of every one of these sectors within a one year time frame. And the starting point is a year ago. So they all start at the same point and they show you whether that sector went up or the sector went down. So some of these uh, sectors here, consumer staples, information technology, healthcare, they averaged and did pretty well. They're in the green, right? The other ones are in the red. So if you pick utilities, you're kind of on the borderline. You pick consumer discretionary real estate. Real estate didn't too, do too well last year in the last calendar year time. So you've got to know which sector you want to invest in, right? Do you believe in healthcare? Maybe you're a nurse, maybe you're a physician's assistant, and you know what's going on. If you're comfortable in that sector, play, play in that sector. Make your, put your investment in that sector. That's what I meant. I didn't mean play in the sector. Um, and then these are the, every day if you click on this page, CNN Money, I've cited the, the website, Click on CNN Money, you go down, you see sector performance. Every day it changes. Every day it's tracked. So decide what sectors. Maybe airlines aren't here, but uh, tends to be that uh, communications, health services, um, 
consumer non-durables, these move up and down all the time. Uh, technology services actually went from, while I was putting together PowerPoint, this went from number one to number eight. It just jumps up and down every day. Okay, so you've got to know what your risk appetite is and what you believe in and what you know about. Okay, so now we're going to start investing. So we can pick a single stock. You can buy a single stock. Most companies, if you have a 401k, they will give you the choice of buying the stock of your company. So if you work for Twitter, you probably get Twitter stock with your paycheck and you can elect how much Twitter stock to do. Or in your 401k, they'll give you a choice for Twitter stock or growth stock and bonds. You'll have a, a menu of options. So we're going to talk a little bit about what these different options look like. All right. So this is... Um, so I wanted to give a note here about the Dow Jones. So the Dow Jones and the Standard & Poor's 500 are two thermometers for the economy. That's all they are. They're made up numbers. So Apple, Coca-Cola, Visa, Master Charge. These are the top 30 companies in the world that are part of the Dow Jones Industrial Average. It was just invented back in the 30s or 40s. It's 30 companies. They put the price of the stock in there. Every day they come up with a point number. And everybody looks at, if you listen to the radio, you'd be like, oh, the Dow is up 500 points today. The Dow is down 500 points today. Oh, things are doing good. Trump talked about tariffs with China. And this thing moves up and down, up and down. And the Dow Jones moves like a roller coaster. You can see from 1997, the purple line is the Dow Jones. And that's how it's tracked. So if you put, if you put $10,000 into the account in 2000, you'll have something like $60,000 at the very top. So it's, it's gone up six times. And that's just the Dow, right? So did those companies become six times more productive? Probably not. It's the price of the stock. Like I said, Apple, you buy Apple at 212, doesn't mean anything. And someone comes along and wants to buy it at 230, doesn't mean anything. They just feel like it's worth more. It's just a price, it's, it's become a commodity. So what's happened is that stock trading is like commodity trading. People are just sort of gambling on the casino, hoping to make a, a new buck. So you've got to invest what you believe in. Okay? So most companies will give you their stock. So I work for PG&E, Pacific Gas Electric Company. I'm offered their stock, or I'm offered a bunch of different funds. I'm offered 23 different funds. And one of the funds is the Dow Jones Fund and the Standard & Poor's Fund. So it's just a ruler. Okay, and it's a, it's a composite, they call it a composite fund. It's just uh, like you could buy one donut or you could buy a box of dozen donuts in variety. It's a big box of variety of stocks put together and they show you what it does. It's a standard, so like a ruler and a meter. Okay, so this is the Dow Jones and most, um, most 401ks will give you this option. They will give you the Dow Jones growth index option. They will give you that. And you can see that this is a little more aggressive. If you see the blue line, the highs are a little higher and the lows are a little lower. It's dipping up and it's dipping down a little bit more than the Dow. And the reason is these Vanguard guys are trying to build their reputation of having a more aggressively managed fund and make more money than the Dow. They're trying to do better than the Dow. They're trying to beat the market, but come up with a fund that's just like the market. So now if you want to buy this, the question is how do I stay away from Riba? If, if I'm in this, what do I do? So if you click on the page, you'll see that the chart has overview, interactive performance, and the most important ones are at the bottom, at the other side, holdings and costs and fees. So if I click on holdings, you'll see here that this stock at that day, it shows you what it's made up of. The, so the Vanguard fund is showing you, you know, what's inside our fund. And it shows you that it's, uh, it's 100% it's stocks and no bonds right now. That might change in a few days if they decide to panic and buy some bonds. But right now when you buy it, you should look at this fund and decide whether you want to protect yourself and stay away from interest. This is a good one, right? So you see that the type is, ca it holds cash, has 98% stocks and 1.1% foreign stocks, no bonds. But then if you look at the right side, you got a little bit of something of a problem here. So um, it's mimicking the Dow. So it's doing Apple, Amazon, Facebook, Alphabet, Alphabet, Visa. So it's got 
Visa in here. And it's got MasterCard in here. It also has Home Depot, it has Coca-Cola, it has other things in there, right? That's what they're trying to do. So you, most of these large, large funds will have some banking in there. They will have banking. It's very difficult to avoid that. The only way to avoid banking and interest in a fund is to actually pick your own stocks and make your own fund. I'll show you how to do that, okay? So this is the thing to do and to teach you guys how to do the research to inshallah, you know, get, get going. But this is, a lot of us are limited by what we're allowed to do. Our 401k will only give us, like I said, 23 options. 10 of them are bonds, so I'm down to 13 options. One of them's PG&E, so I'm down to 12. So I've got 12 options. I've got to do the best that I can and then do tawbah for the rest because if I don't invest a little bit, I'm going to not have any fun. So I try to do the best I can. All right, so the next um, slide. We're trying to get through nine more minutes, so there's a few slides I want to get to. Okay, so this is my expertise, right? I'm not pitching my, my company stock. And actually, if you listen to me, you'll run away from the stock. So in 2009, this stock, 2009, the market crashed. If you look at the red dots that I circled, 2009, there's two black dots over here. On the very side, I think the ladies, you can see it. If you had $10,000 invested and the market crashed, pg and &E was at $9,845. It didn't really go down. It's very, very stable against a market crash. Okay, but the market, the Dow, the S&P, this is against the Standard and Poor 500, the best 500 companies. Those companies, their $10,000 investment went down to 5,800. 5, you lost 42% of your money by doing nothing. Just sitting there, market crashed, you had a recession. So this stock is anti, it's, it's not volatile like the market. So in times of making money, you don't make a lot of money. pg and &E stock doesn't shoot up to the sky. But in times of crashes, it doesn't fall to the ground. So it's not like a roller coaster. It's more stable. So then the other thing that happens with pg and &E is that if you decide to invest in only one stock, which I don't recommend, and you're in pg and &E stock, you get to 2017 in October, and it's doing really, really well. Your $10,000 is about 24 k And then there's the Napa fires. The Napa fires happened in October of 2017. There were 20 fires. And the people of Napa decided that they were going to sue PG&E for the fires, the fault of the fires. So our stock price went from $70 to $38. And your $24,000 investment went down to $16,000. It's all a big loss. So when you invest in only one company, you're, you're susceptible to their risk, you're susceptible to their scandal, and you're susceptible to their faults. So you don't want to invest in one company either, right? So this is just a demonstration to, that you need to learn the next keyword. We learned compound interest. We learned fund. And now we want to learn about diversification. So a fund is diversified. It's like that box of donuts. You, it's, a, it's a random selection. So if you want to be in a sector, you want to be in the airline sector, you don't want to just buy Continental Airlines. You want to buy Continental, Delta, United, um, Virgin Air. You want to buy a bunch of them so that you're safe from one company doing something really bad. If you're in the airline sector and there's an airline crash, they're all coming down. So you've got to be diversified. And also, don't be in one sector. So this is, a, this is just a demonstration. So PG&E is 75% less volatile than the market. We actually have a rating. And we know that rating. So if the market goes down, we tend to sort of have a shock absorber. We don't go down as much, we don't go up as much. We have a rating of volatility. Okay, the next one is what I kind of recommend you do, is if you want utilities, and you like utilities, you believe in utilities, then buy a utility fund. So you can go and get away from the Dow, get away from the S&P, and choose the, fund, the sector you want, but have it diversified in the fund. So this is the, this is the F U G A X. This is the Fidelity Utility Growth Fund. So again, it didn't say bonds, it's about growth. So you're staying away from interest. And this, you can see that if you get to 2017, PG&E crashed, but the purple fund still did pretty well. So it's, it's a blend of a lot of utilities, right? So you want to stay away from one, one stock in one fund, in, in one sector. So 
if I prefer utilities, I want to do the utility growth fund. If I want to stay away from the Dow, I want to stay away from that and pick the utility fund. Okay. So that's just one sector. So I showed you the Dow, the S&P. I showed you a utility stock. I showed you a utility fund. And I'll show you another one more before we go to Isha, inshallah. And the next one I wanted to show you, is, and you do the same research. You can click on it. You can see what the holdings are. You can see that there's some companies that are investing in renewable energy, some companies that are utilities, and it's pretty good. And I'll show you its performance. Okay, and this one I wanted to show you, which is the other way of investing, which is real estate. So there's a fund that you can buy. You don't have to buy a property. But a lot of people tell me, I don't have enough money to buy a house, an income property. You don't have to have money to buy a house. You could put your 401k, if you have the choice, and buy a utility fund. I mean, a, a real estate investment fund. So if you read about it, it'll say discreetly what it is. This, the investment seeks a high level of current income. Capital appreciation is a secondary objective. So this fund is actually investing in real estate that gives income. And while the price isn't shooting up, look at this performance. It's actually not very good. You know, it's not doing well. But what you're not understanding on this blue line is while the price isn't going up and down, every month it's giving you a few dollars. Every year it's giving you a few dollars. So if you have 50 shares, you're going to get another five. You get another four. Every year you're going to get a few shares of income. Okay? So it's not rated as, as a good fund in terms of its growth, but it's rated as a good fund in terms of its income. And it, that income leads into that compounding graph. So the more income you get, it's kind of recycled and keeps going. Right? So this, you can see here, that if you don't want this fund, if you want to stay away from RIBA again, you can go to the holdings and decide, you know what? I really like public storage. I know that Americans are really, um, they like to buy stuff, too much stuff, and then they don't have enough room in their house, so they go and put it in a public storage unit. Once they put it in a public storage unit, do you ever hear of anybody getting rid of their stuff? No. It's a solid investment. I'm just, you know, hypothetical. So you can go here and you can decide that I'm just going to buy these three funds here. I'm not going to buy the whole fund. I'm just going to buy the ones that are there. So all the research is there on the internet. You can go and look at it. Okay, so this is what I wanted to demonstrate tonight. This is what I wanted to show you guys and give you an overview for is how to approach this how to approach it in a halal way, inshallah, that protects our families, protects us from, 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 uh, from uh, receiving interest inadvertently, doing our best that we can do in order to uh, invest wisely. And then, you know, the barakah and the provision is from Allah. But you're doing your part. You're doing your part with the best intentions. And may Allah protect our families and, our, and allow us to earn, to, to earn his pleasure in doing the best that we can um, to do that. Um, let's see how I wanted to... Um, Right on time. How am I doing, Munir? Two minutes. Okay. All right. So, again, it's a very, very, like I said, stocks should be thought of as a, an investment in a company. If I came to you and said, give me your money, you're going to ask me a bunch of questions. Don't just throw your money in stock. And what happens now is that the markets are treated like commodities. So what's happening with these big six banks, investment houses, they are running AI. Artificial intelligence. Look at this headline here. Like it's something good, right? The first ever managed fund by a robot is here. So far, it's beating the market. So they're trying to tell you that this friendly little robot, you know, it's doing pretty well. He's beating the market. He's not beating the market. This is a rigged game. He is not beating the market. He is beating you. And he will beat you every time. This robot is working 24 hours a day. It's trading in China and Japan right now, and it's front-running trades. So you know when you do a Google search and you get like 4.5 billion hits in like a fourth of a second? That's your normal computer. These computers are 20 times faster than that. They're computers. They, they make, on a $10 billion fund, which is average, they make $50 million in a half an hour, just taking money from somebody else. Buying high, buying low, selling, jumping up the price, selling high and getting out. Every day you're seeing this, if you watch the market. So this is not a friendly robot. The Time magazine is deceiving you with these articles. This is not a good thing. So we have to invest for the long term. We have to know what sectors we're in. And we have to protect ourselves and be in solid places so that the companies have standard and solid foundations in what we're doing and believe in that. 
right? So that's, and, and also tries to get the income. Don't try to play this price game with this guy. You can't beat him in chess. You're not gonna beat him on the global uh, economic settlements market if you can't beat him in chess on your computer. There's no way, no way. These are the biggest, most richest people, the smartest people in the world. Uh, we do hedging at PG&E, a last note. The hedging statement is mathematically 37 pages. I, it's impossible for me to read every day. That's how sophisticated this is. Okay, so inshallah, that's the, uh, that's the uh, note for the, for the talk. Get started early. There are many investment specialists uh, in, at work in our community. One of the things I wanna say is if you go and meet a stockbroker, make sure they have the heart of a teacher and not the heart of a salesman. Don't let them tell you what to do with your money. Ask them to teach you what you can do, what you should invest in, what's good, and what's the future outlook. If they can't answer the questions in this bottom bullet here, the bold bullet, they need to tell you the benefits, the pitfalls, and the potential scenarios of all your choices. And then there's some bullets down here for the best different online investment. So anyway, assalamu alaikum. Thank you for your attendance. Inshallah, may Allah protect our, 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 our provision, our families, and allow us to gain his pleasure. Um, so we're going to, uh, bismillah, we're going to restart. And we're going to do two questions from the sister side, and then we'll, we'll ping pong back to the brother side, and then we'll keep on going back and forth, inshallah. So I'm going to just hand the mic over, and looks like I'm just going to hand the mic over to you, sister, and then you can be the moderator. Assalamualaikum. Jazakallah khair for, um, for this talk. I had a, well, one clarification question and then um, an additional question. The clarification was when we we're talking about real estate investment trusts, you said something along the lines of if you want to avoid riba, you can invest in individual um, you know, investment holdings or real estate holdings. Um, I didn't know that there was, there was actually any riba involved in real estate investment trusts. And if you could speak to that. Is it open? Is it on? Uh, I just wanted to make it clear that most investment in real estate is done through loans. So those companies are financing all their properties that they're buying through loans. Right? So, I raise the volume? Okay. So I wanted to make it clear, uh, jumping to the um, Aberdeen Fund. And again, I wanted to introduce you guys to Vanguard, Fidelity, Aberdeen. These are all companies that have products. So this is the real estate fund, Aberdeen. And the holdings there, most of the companies are buying public storage when they finance a new facility, they're buying it through, through uh, financing through, through loans and banks. Everybody's financing, working cash, every company is doing that. But on your side, your transaction, you're looking for income, right? So you have to do the best you can for that. So I'm saying that if you're, my point was if you're not comfortable with some of the financing options that, th that are there, you can go to the specific company and just select the companies that you want. Um, but you'd have to open up your own Ameritrade account. And this, this is why I showed the last one. So that if you look at the last bullets on the bottom, these are the companies that you can go online and build your own 401k and your own fund from. So if you wanna buy public storage and you wanna buy an airline stock and you wanna diversify, you would go there and pick your own individual stocks. You don't have to buy from Aberdeen. You don't have to buy their mix of funds. So this uh, online brokerage, TD Ameritrade, they allow you to actually pick stocks that you want to pick individually. So you do your research here and you decide, well, um, I think I went back too far. You decide that you want two or the three of those and not all of them. So you don't buy the Aberdeen fund. You can just go and select the funds you want, the, the select the stocks you want and put them in your TD Ameritrade account. That's how you would do it, to, to try to do it yourself. Does that answer your question? It does, Jazakallah Khair. I hadn't considered, you know, looking at their expense sheet to, you know, to kind of see where they were, like, you know, how much they were paying in interest, for instance, mm -hmm. as an indication of how halal, you know, um, an investment could be. Yeah, you can, you can see their debt ratio. Right. So there's an equity debt ratio with a lot of companies. Mm -hmm. And there's usually um, some companies and some industries have a higher equity ratio. And you can stay away from uh, if you do your part, you can stay away from more leverage companies, more debt co companies that carry more debt. Does anybody else want to? So, like a, a just quick question. Um, so, my school district offers a 403b, but it's a huge list of different ones, and I have no idea which one to choose. Um, 
so yeah, you will get a selection of funds. So um, bonds are bonds yeah. for there. Okay. And then if you eliminate those, you'll probably have, I'm guessing, a selection of usually somewhere 40 or below funds. And then they'll usually have a couple of keywords in them. And if you go back to this, um, the reason why I showed you the names is if you go back to um, Vanguard, you'll see that usually they have a name and then they have growth index. Mm -hmm. So growth index means it's focused on the growth of stocks and it's index money. It moves up and down with their price. Mm -hmm. And then the other one is uh, um, utility. This is a utility, um, I think this is utility mutual fund. So this is a utility index. So you use those terms. If you look at your funds at your 4013B, you'll have a selection. And in that they'll say high, High cap, meaning large companies, high, uh, what's cap, market, market cap. It's how much the stocks, the company's overall stocks are worth. So there's high, medium, and low. You'll have those for index funds. And then you'll also have something that says international bond funds, and you'll eliminate those. And then they'll, it'll also say international currency funds, and you probably don't want to mess with international <laughs> currency exchanges. So you want to focus on the growth and in index funds of your 4013B. Okay. If you have questions, you can then set up an appointment. I do some financial uh, counseling one-on-one -on -one here, Ooh. and uh, Munir and Amina, sister Amina, set up my appointments. So once a month, I come in for a couple hours and I meet with folks. So I can, I'm not giving investment advice, <laughs> again, but I try to help folks out, try to decipher what to do and help them make more informed decisions. Okay, thank you so much, Joseph. Take care. Brothers. So in the same line, um, most companies, they have debt, right? So, um, but as a stock investor into that company, um, does that uh, contributing to Reba? The company, is, the company is involved in interest. They're charging interest, they're gaining interest, all their funds, everything, all their accounts are gaining interest every day. Working cash is gaining interest every day. There's nothing you can do to avoid that. If you invest in a company, you will have to look at their bank statement and you'll see that they're, 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 they have debt. So along the same line, uh, actually most of the company also invest their money in stocks and buy back right, plans. And sometimes they invest really, uh, even technology in, companies, they invest their money, right, which is more of an interest gain. So can you shed some light whether this will be a halal investment if you buy a stock from those companies, even technology companies? Even technology? Well, you have to look at their holdings. So some companies will invest heavily in, in Visa and MasterCard. That's where they put their money. Some, people, some companies will invest in gambling and casinos. So you, you, you have to do your own part. I can't, I can't tell you what to do. I can't make a fatwa. But you have to do the research that you can. I, can. I know for 25 years I've worked in utilities. Our debt equity ratio is 45 to 55 percent. And our cash, working cash, is usually just invested in money market. Uh, our checking accounts just gain interest from the banks that hold them. Our bank is Mellon Bank in, in New York. That's all we do. We're not going out putting our working cash and making it work for us by buying casino stocks and buying liquor stocks. That's not what we're trying to do. So uh, I feel pretty confident about telling you about that. Again, I'm not pushing my company stock, but different industries have different things that they do. Uh, that's a very conservative industry. We're heavily regulated, and we're not allowed to play with the money to try to make more money. We're trying to provide a service of electricity and gas in a very safe way, right? And we also do some hedging, but the hedging is not betting. It's just trying to build a base of gas and electricity so that we don't have uh, rate shocks when there's hurricanes and things like that. So I can tell you from my experience that that's what's happening in the utility industry. You can go in a company, uh, there's a Lazarus fund, and it invests in windmills and solar farms. So if that's something that you feel is pretty safe, and that's where their project development costs are, that's where their capital is, that's pretty good. You're avoiding a company that's playing with alcohol, casino, and gambling, and things, gaining a lot of interest, leveraging things like that. Another um, example would be like real estate. You know, are they are they 
paying interest for their properties, but not engaging in in putting their money in all these other stocks, right? So uh, tech stocks actually buy a lot of companies. So Google, Microsoft, Apple are buying tons of small companies. They have so much cash, they have to keep buying companies. So are they buying companies like that? Or are they diversifying into alcohol and gambling and, and things like that that you don't want to be involved in? So that's all I can say. Uh, otherwise, I mean, zero is very impossible. So there are some companies that are trying to, um, they're trying to uh, do it the halal way and come up with a way of saying, this is the most halal, uh, the least interest and the least problematic things that are in their accounts as possible. Um, but those companies, I, I don't know the name of those companies. There's, there's some different ventures out there that are doing that. Another, yeah. can I answer that question? I had a question. So, assalamu alaikum. What does Islam say about investing in cryptocurrency and also buying cryptocurrency? No comment. I'm not giving any fatwas or anything like that. I'm just giving uh, analysis of stocks and things like that. So, I'm not going to comment on that. Good to sisters, I'll come back. Assalamu alaikum, brother. So, given the fact that we live here in the Bay Area where house prices are very expensive, so if one was to wait until uh, we save enough money to buy a $800,000 or $1 million home, it might take us until we retire. So we'll be renting and paying to someone else. So then we kind of force, if we want to leave here, to take a loan and pay interest. So is this considered as riba? Paying interest on a mortgage is riba. Yes. Okay. okay. Exactly. There is an alternative. Um, I've seen a presentation from Guidance Financial, and there's also Universe, UIF and Amin Housing. Those three names I will say because I do know that they're uh, I know that people have, who are, who are uh, really specialist in halal contracts and evaluating the way the contracts are written actually have uh, approved these three um, institutions and they have a um, Sharia compliant lending program which is based on co-ownership. So you and the bank, you put down a down payment of 30%, the bank puts down 70%, you co-own the property, just like your father would own 70%, and then you buy back the shares based on a formula, which is not based on interest. So it's called the Co-Ownership Declining Balance Buyback Program. Okay. And that's a mouthful. Co-Ownership Declining Balance Buyback Program. Okay. So there's a couple of things, university, guidance, I mean. So U I can give you. University, guidance, I mean, UG, UGI? University Financial is one. Okay. Guidance. Oh, it's separate company. Yeah, Guidance. Guidance Sheep. Financial is another. Okay. You just have to Google uh, right. Sharia No Riba Guidance Financial Go or on. University UIF. University something UIF. Okay. And then the last one is Amin Housing Cooperative. Okay. In exactly. So those exactly. are the three that I would recommend for uh, staying away from mortgages. Sorry, and then I would actually advise against Amin Housing, um, having got out of them, but that's another story. My other question to you, oh, sorry. Um, I have this other question in terms of, you know, is there a way of like cleansing, like potentially a percentage of the income that comes in, you know, that you can estimate from RIBA and then giving that away as, to be, you know, to take precautions against having that, you know, weigh on you, right? When you're investing that may be like, you know, once a year at some point in time assessing um, what's the percentage of um, investment in a particular, you know, mutual fund from in, you know, in banking or credit card industry and then uh, what percentage of, you know, gains have you had and then giving that away as a way to... I, I don't know the ruling on that. Okay. You can talk to Imam Tahir who's affiliated with the mosque or Sheikh Rami if you have a specific question. Um, you know, those numbers are very, like, knowing how much of what stocks you've bought and how much of that could be problematic income and then figuring out what to do with that problematic income to give it away so that it's not on your, you know, on your record with Allah, that's not what I can tell you. But I can tell you that 
um, if you want that kind of guidance, you should probably set up a meeting with Imam Tahir and stuff and, and, and figure out a plan for your zakat and sadaqah on top of your zakat so that you can get that, that income out of your wealth. Uh, hi, uh, I have a quick question for some of the website when you're going to buy uh, stock like like Yahoo Finance. Mm -hmm. There are like quite a few value like price per earning, earning per stock, you know, it's like yeah. so many information. So do you know, you know, which which value are more important when you're going to? check you know the stock and you know if you want to buy it if you want to invest on that you know is there any like four or four, five parameter that you check that and you get idea you know how company is doing yeah so the most important number is the price earnings ratio pe ratio it's price over earnings and then their dividend payout so every company has a policy a stated policy and a history of uh what their earnings and profits are and then based on those earnings and profits, how much shares they give to their employees and bonus plans, and how much money they return to the shareholders in terms of dividend income. So, so you wanna look for, again, growth is, is you buy a $50 stock and you're hoping it's gonna be $70, right? And the income is that that company's $50 stock gives you a $2 dividend every year. So if you buy 100 shares, you're gonna get $200, uh, $2,000, you know, in dividend income every year. You get that reinvested and compounded. So price earnings ratio and dividend payout are very important. And then risks. Um, you know, a, a lot of people don't like regulation and they don't like taxation. Those things determine the future of companies very, very dramatically. Um, and so those are those are things that in the industry they, they try to look at. So you've got a couple of those things. Um, uh, each, if you go to Fidelity, they'll do a research on each company. Like when, when I tell you to click on, let's say Yahoo, you can go on Yahoo and actually look at their stats and their balance sheet, and you can see the Wall Street write-up by different Wall Streets. So Fidelity will have a write-up on Yahoo, and it will say this stock is a buy, hold, or sell for the next quarter, for the next year. So they're giving you investing advice, and then you can read that and decide if you believe it or not, if you think it's reasonable. So every stock has a buy, buy, buy. Uh, you, you can look at every stock and say, is it a buy, sell, or hold? And, and read its risks, and they'll actually write up for you. So one of my cousins works for uh, Fidelity, and he's a manager in the utility and airline sector. And every day his job is to make sure he's doing the write-ups for all the utility companies, utility funds, and airline companies and funds. That's his job. So you can go and read the Wall Street write-ups of those companies. And that's a good way to go. And once you start reading them, you'll, you'll, get, you'll get better at sort of understanding what they're saying and why they're saying it. So they should tell you why it's a buy. They'll tell you why it's a sell and just decide that way. But every, if you invest, you should be investing and then reviewing every quarter. If you're going to actively manage your, your investments, you should be reviewing them every quarter. You don't want to look at them daily up and down. That'll just give you a heart attack. So, shall so Another welcome. question? Yeah, Asalaamu so Alaikum. Right here. Welcome, um, so there's been a little bit of talk about market correction, and I think you mentioned that earlier. So I just have a two-part question. Um, so number one, what is a market correction? And number two, in your opinion, which cap, large cap, small cap, will be the safest bet when it comes to market correction, if it happens? So I, I, again, this is assuming, <laughs> this is your personal opinion, and uh, that's, that was my question. So uh, things can't go up forever. You see that graph there? There's actually a line, a red line that you might not have noticed. That's called the 50-day DAM, the 50-day ahead, the day 50-day average price DAM. So it's taking the volatility out, and it's taking an average of the last 50 days price every day. It takes the last 50 days. So that red line is trending. You see how it goes up and down? The red line kind of stays the same. But now look at it going to the top. Can things just go up forever where the average, the every day's price is going up and the average stays going up forever? Um, you know, we, a lot of people will tell you in the, in, in, in the financial news that we're in some kind of a bubble. So meaning things are overly inflated. And so we have to determine, individually you have to determine to who you're going to listen to and what you believe. Uh, so right now the Dow Jones is 
been dropping from 26.9 a couple weeks ago to 25,000. 25, so it's lost 2,000. It's lost 2,000 points, or about 7% of the market. So some people are really, really worried that this is a, you know, is it a small earthquake, or is it just the beginning of a very big landslide? And where is the market going to go? So you have to make that determination. You have to read the different sectors. Um, one of the reasons why I chose the utility sector, which is here, is to show you that um, graph, this one right here. In 2000, and I wanted to make sure that this graph showed you 2009. Our company is rated as a negative 74% volatility with the market. Meaning if the market dropped, goes up one, drops one point, we will only drop 20, 20 points. We're a little bit safer. And the different sectors I wanted to show you, you know, in our investment sectors is there's stocks, there's real estate, and there's different ind industrials and commodities. So my answer to your question is you need to be, you need to be on this graph as well, right? You need to um, go back to the 12 matrix box right here. And any financial advisor will tell you that 50% of yours should be in the lower four boxes, medium to low. And then 30% of your investments should be in the medium and 10% you play with. So, you know, you're trying, you're trying to play with 10% and really hit a home run. So you should have, you know, utility stocks, real estate stocks. Um, one of the stocks that does really well in recession times is uh, consumer durables. So uh, people stop buying, you know, stop buying Tesla stock and they start buying rice, bread, wheat. They stop going out to dinner and they start buying staples. So Nabisco, those kinds of stocks tend to do well. And I put those sectors in, um, in this, uh, where's the sector graph? That's the next one right here. So all these different sectors are what you believe. So your question, my question to you, you can ask me a question, I'll ask you a question back. Which sectors do you think are the safest in a time of a recession? I gave you an answer. Consumer, consumables. They don't do that well now, but they might be doing pretty well later. Um, and investor confidence is, is also big. If everybody freaks out and wants to take their money out of the market, it will collapse. You have to keep your money in there. So uh, it depends on how much confidence you think that people have with the outlook of the future. And politics plays a lot of uh, point in that. And you know, we have a lot of disagreement on, on politics right now. What's happening with China? So I, I can't answer all those questions. You have to make those individual decisions yourself and, and see what you feel. Um, I will give you a shocking stat though, that um, right now the markets are trading that two and a half times the revenue of all the companies in them. Okay, so if the companies are making a trillion dollars in a year, that's the gross value of what the companies are making. The market is right now trading at 2.5 trillion dollars. So it's two and a half times multiple of what the revenue of the company is in it. That's not good fundamental economics, but you can still make money. So that's the thing, that's where the casino and the commodity part of it comes in. It's very, to me, that's, that's if you look at the books, that's alarming. If I said, give me a million dollars, I want to make, um, I only make $100,000 of revenue a year, but I want two and a half million dollars from you as an investment, you're probably not going to invest in my company. Right? But that's the way the markets are trading, right? Uh, question over here. Did, did I answer your question? Whose question? Was I have a question. And then we'll go to you. And I don't know how what the time is, do you want to, for your life. Okay. Asalaamu As Alaikum. Uh, thank you for the information. Very helpful. Um, so going back to the topic of what's permissible and what is Sharia compliant, I was wondering if there is a list of Sharia compliant stocks and the same for a list of um, Sharia compliant investments. I don't know if you have that information handy or if it's available somewhere that can be pointed out too, so we can do more research. I Going back to your statement of look, look in investment funds, mm -hmm. right? But go down to the sectors, go down to the companies specifically, yeah. do your homework because no company is going to be without interest. Let's face it, right? right? It's a primary source of income, primary business that we need to look at and then do your homework. But I was wondering if there is something out there already today that you can find us to. So, so there was a startup that I know of that was trying to rate stocks by their halalness rating. So they were looking at doing all this research and making sure that the stocks were 
interest and if the minimal amount of interest, no casino, no gambling, no pornography, those kinds of things. So there was a startup that was doing that. Um, they, didn't, they couldn't get the accounts international, so they didn't do well. But actually, I was having a conversation with someone today who told me that there's a company that just raised $40 million because they have that financial model. And they were able to uh, have international accounts. I will find out the name of that company, and I will actually post it uh, on the event update. So I'll hope to get that in a week. Okay, so there is a comp there's there's a lot of Muslims who want who want that model. It's just can someone do that model and get funded? There is a company out there. I can't remember what it's called. Raza, that's me again. So for an IRA account or a 401k, do we have a way to sell everything and just leave it as cash, just because we don't want you know, everything to be wiped out, but we just leave it as cash? Yeah. So so some of them have that option. So. Uh, they will let you sell your, so 401k is based on 401k, which is a, a law, it's a legislation. And you have to, if you put your money in a 401k account, you cannot withdraw it until you're 59 and a half. And, and then you have to pay taxes on it as income, but you don't get, you get to avoid the taxes while, while you put it in there. Some of those funds have the ability to park your, your fund, sell your fund, put it in cash. Some of them don't. They, they actually recommend you do it in bonds. That's what, that's what the investment community thinks. Like, why would you want to put it in cash? That's crazy. You're going to not, you can put it in cash and not put it in a bond. So they, they, they deal in interest and they think it's crazy to have something that's just cash. So a lot of them don't give that option, but some do. And it just depends. It just yeah. depends. I cannot remember, um, if my company allows me to do that. I, I can't remember. So yeah, I was asking that because I had an IRA account with Fidelity that I just roll over, but I didn't know that I could leave it there as a cash, so I placed yeah. it and now I'm losing. Then they told me, oh, you, you could, could have, have left, left, left it as yeah. cash. So. And uh, for those who don't know the acronym, IRA is Individual Retirement Account, and it's also, uh, a, it, there's a law and there's a, there's a class of funds that allows you to, to avoid taxes and put it in there. So you rolled over your IRA to another account, but you could have left it in cash. Yeah, and that would have been a, well, timing the market. You could still do that. Oh, uh, there's a question. What about investing in commodities? I mean, as, as a way to avoid rip up? Um, Commodity markets. You can invest in commodities, but it, they, they move up and down like that spaghetti graph. Um, and you are not in control of what's going on. So uh, rice, uh, heating oil, um, gold, silver, all those things you can, you can invest in. And, and you have to make a decision. So just on gold and silver, you can buy an electronically traded fund, which is based on the gold and silver price, or you can buy physical gold and silver. Like have $1,000 of silver coins, have $10,000 you know, of gold, um, buy jewelry, you know, but then you have to pay zakat on it. So yeah, you, that's one way to diversify really well. I mean, um, there are people that will tell you that you know you should have some gold, some silver, some mutual funds, you know, and some food stored in your house. That's really well diversified. If you're really worried, uh, does that answer your question? Yeah. So I was gonna get back to the sister's suggestion of living. Uh, money as cash in yeah. IRA account, then it won't be investing, right? We wanna, you want to take advantage of yes. the investing, the time value of money. Mm -hmm. So obviously putting in a fund yeah. or stock would be, you know, uh, right. would be investing. But her suggestion was um, this graph here in 2009, if you would have parked it in cash for about two years, mm -hmm. rather than ride the blue line, you would have been way better off, and then you put the cash back on the blue line or the purple line. Yeah, so you, but you take it out of the you take it out of the stock, keep it in cash, hold it while the market goes down. But again, you're timing it. You're saying, I believe that I'm going to do it. So um, then you lose out on what the brother is saying, which is if you don't, if you put put it in cash and the the IRA and stocks are still growing, then you've you've basically given up the chance to, for that to grow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah, yeah so yeah. you're a month too late. So um, I was going to add, uh, there is other options for IRA, which is self-directed IRAs, which gives you a lot more uh, flexibility yeah. on different types of investment you can do as well if you know if somebody yeah. chooses to. Yeah, and there's a lot of there's a lot of good brothers in the Muslim community that are certified financial analysts. They have companies you can get their cards from MCC and go meet with them and they'll they'll do the whole financial planning for you. They'll do IRA. There's college funds. There's 401k funds. Um, there's and they'll and they'll tell you the tax. I, I personally have a hard time with taxation policy. It's not my favorite thing to read. So they are really up on the tax laws. That's what their expertise is far beyond mine. I know one brother, his, uh, his company's name is Total Wealth Management. Um, he, um, I attended his presentation, so he has uh, ideas about uh, you know, halal investing. So somebody might you know, check him out. I personally do not invest with him as a disclaimer. Any other questions? I think that's a wrap. Wrap it up. Okay. Well, yeah. thank you all for your attendance. Uh, inshallah, this is help. Hopefully helpful.